My name is Mohammed Al Shatal. I'm the director of public works for the city of Muskegon. I graduated from the University of Detroit in 1988 with a bachelor's degree in civil engineering. I moved to the city of Muskegon in, nine, uh, in 1991. Became the, the permit engineer in 1991 and moved uh, through the ranks um, to become the director of public works. Uh, once again, the public works department for the city of Muskegon is in charge of pretty much all that you see out there from streets, designing, plowing, uh, storm sewer, sanitary sewer collection, water mains that you see out there. Uh, and probably it's unusual for us around this time not to see snow, but we are in charge of snow plowing as well. Um, what, what I'd like to focus on tonight, uh, because we have a lot of uh, subjects in that department, is probably the water uh, resource, if you will, and compare that we have in here versus what uh, my homeland country of Jordan, if you will. Uh, before we get to that, I want to give you a, a quick uh, glimpse of my personal life. I did come into the United States back in 1982 after graduating from high school for the purpose of going to school. Uh, and as you know, we all have our own plans and there are, we make our own plans and somebody else makes plans for us. And very seldom do those paths run this, I mean, they, they follow the same path, I guess. My plan was to graduate in uh, 85, 86 or 87 at the latest and go back home uh, to work with my dad. As a matter of fact, uh, 1982 to those of you that are soccer fans, me and my dad were watching the World Cup in 1982, June and July of 1982, and I remember vividly saying, Dad, I'll be going, finishing school, and we'll be watching the next World Cup together again in Jordan. That was the last World Cup that we have ever watched together, or any soccer game for that matter. He's, he's uh, overseas and I'm here. I got married here to uh, a Czechoslovakian lady. We ended up having four kids three of which went to this great school right here. Two of them graduated and uh, one is still going in here and he promised to be here to tease me, but luckily he's not here. So, <laughs> what I'd like to start with I, 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 uh, also is to share with you, I'm not here to lecture you or teach you anything new. I'm here purely to share with you some of my experiences having lived on both sides of the, 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 the big bond, as they refer to it. And with that, I'd like to start by showing you a couple of videos that I have been able to find on, I'd like to take credit that I made them up, but YouTube is going to uh, show me up. But uh, I'd like to run those uh, videos by you or share with you those two videos. One, it goes. To, uh, one goes to what Jordan is all about, some facts about Jordan itself, the country, and then the other one is about water resources and how, what methodology, uh, what methodology is available out there to extract the, the, what is referred to as the liquid gold nowadays. Fresh water, as I'm sure, well, I'm not so sure people in this region do recognize how important and how how much, how good we have it in this region of the Great Lakes and in this country in general. Uh, and we'll go from there, if that's okay with you. Then come to a place where you can push the envelope and at the same time explore history, perfectly preserved. A place where a desert as vast as a sea suddenly opens to reveal astonishing secrets. This is a mystical land, an unexpected oasis that throughout the ages has witnessed the triumphs and the milestones of the world's great religions. All who come here are moved by its beauty, its people, and its soul. This ancient kingdom exists on the threshold of a dream and at the edge of history.
this is Jordan. Jordan, it's an ancient land with a very modern attitude. Now the last time I was here, I had a very special tour guide to show me around this incredible country, His Majesty King Abdullah II. And we did it in some very unusual ways. Since then, I've learned a lot about the diversity of Jordan and its wealth of experiences. And now, it's your turn. I'm Peter Greenberg. Please join me as I take you on a special tour of Jordan, its people, and its treasures. Most people only think they know where Jordan is, but even fewer know what lies within its borders. Perhaps some of you may have heard of Petra or Wadi Rum, the magical desert places of Jordan. But there's a lot more to this Middle Eastern kingdom than most people expect. Start in Amman, the urban and cultural center of Jordan. Nestled in the rolling hills of this city of nearly two million, is where you'll find Jordan's hotspots, trendy restaurants, dance clubs, museums, and of course, shopping. Amman is the commercial center of this rapidly growing country, a geographical hub with a modern infrastructure for tourism, business travel, transportation, and a country that boasts luxury accommodations, as well as state-of-the-art convention centers. But take a short drive out of the city, and you enter a brave new world, of the past. Jordanians can trace their ancestry to the very beginnings of civilization. Ruins of cultures thousands of years old are everywhere. Take a day trip to the desert palaces less than an hour east of Amman. Or view the imposing Crusader and Arab fortresses of Karak and Ajlou. But a walk through these magnificent castles is just the beginning of your trip through history. Jordan's greatest sights are still to come. Take a walk back through time in Jerash, one of the best preserved Roman cities in the world. This is the same stone path that witnessed the rise and fall of empires, an area first inhabited more than 6,000 years ago. Stand at the crossroads of the colonnade and close your eyes. You can almost hear the chariots rolling through one of history's great Roman cities. And in summer, the Festival of Culture and Arts brings this once vibrant city back to life. With dancers, musicians, and theater in a celebration of Jordanian and international culture. In the mountains of Wadi Musa lies perhaps Jordan's greatest treasure, a city so shrouded in mystery that its very existence remained a carefully guarded Bedouin secret until the 19th century. The lost city of Petra. Your journey to Petra the mile-long natural beauty of the Sikh Canyon. You can walk the Sikh or take a horse-drawn carriage. When I visited with the king, we came down the old-fashioned way. Then, the 650-foot-high sandstone walls offer a mesmerizing glimpse, and then dramatically open to reveal Jordan's grandest icon, the treasury of Petra. Carved centuries ago out of solid rock, you may recognize this massive ancient monument from its most famous movie roles. Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, and The Mummy Returns. The treasury stands guard over the entrance to Petra, a city containing over 800 carved tombs, reliefs, and Bedouin caves. As many as 30,000 people once lived here, and it was still home to Bedouin tribes into the 1980s. Today, Petra is honored as one of the few protected UNESCO World Heritage Sites. But who built this incredible city and the imposing tombs surrounding it? Even now there are questions. 
but the mystery of Petra takes on a new world at night. Walk the Seek Canyon by the light of a thousand hand-placed candles and feel the mystique of the treasury under the stars. It's an unforgettable location and an unforgettable experience. Of course, Jordan isn't just about sightseeing. It's also about adventure. Sail a schooner in the Gulf of Aqaba. Then jet ski the coast. Or for a more panoramic view, take a leap and go parasail. And if water sports is your thing, then go deeper. You can scuba or snorkel what world-class divers know is one of the great, but mostly unknown, dive sites in the world. And of course, no trip to Jordan would be complete without a visit to the lowest spot on the planet for a swim in the Dead Sea, where the naturally buoyant salt water lets you float effortlessly. The Dead Sea is also home to some of Jordan's luxury resorts and spas, where you can sun, swim, and soak up the therapeutic effects of the Dead Sea's minerals and air. Not to mention a skin treatment with a little of the Dead Sea's legendary mud. a land of unparalleled and unexpected contrasts. Sweeping deserts give way to lush forests and green oases filled with exotic animals. Hike the Grand Canyons of the Danner Nature Reserve where dramatic cliffs rise nearly a mile and then drop below sea level. In this spectacular setting you can find flora and fauna from the continents of Africa, Asia and Europe. Or watch the sunrise from your tent at a campsite that's different from any other, on a plateau overlooking a 1,500-foot drop. If you have a sense of adventure, there's hiking, climbing, and rappelling in the stunning gorges of the Wadi Mujib. You can be a beginner or an outright thrill-seeker. <laughs> And there's no desert in the world like the Wadi Rum. Explore the landscape made famous by T.E. Lawrence and the location for the films Lawrence of Arabia as well as Mission to Mars. A desert of ruby sands and cliffs where the Bedouins still roam. Camp out in a Bedouin enclave and live the ancient nomadic desert culture firsthand, surrounded by 3,000-year-old inscriptions and panoramic desert sunsets that are unlike anything you've ever seen. In its truest essence, Jordan is a spiritual and biblical land, the setting for many of the great tales of both the Old and the New Testaments. The heights of Mount Nebo, where Moses first saw the Holy Land, the shores of Bethany beyond the Jordan, where Jesus was baptized. The mountaintop tomb of Aaron and the King's Highway, the road used by Moses to cross the desert and which is still in use today. And as the sun sets, prayer calls from Jordan's great mosques echo from one end of the city to the other. A spiritual experience for those of any belief. You've just seen the appetizer. The main meal is yet to come. We've only really scratched the surface of all the surprises and discoveries that await you here in Jordan. To gaze out at the Wadi Rum, to walk Petra, even to have dinner with the locals. That's what you need to do when you get here. And once you do that, then you'll know what I know. The magical, mystical tour that is Jordan. I hope you do go visit Jordan someday and I guarantee you, you will enjoy it. 
Before I show the next video uh, clip that I had, I wanted to share with you some numbers, if you will, or some statistics about the water because it has so much to do with water and uh, how we, uh, we as human race need, uh, how, how much we need it as a human race and how scarce it is in the world. Jordan does not have much resources, natural resources. Uh, source of water is basically the Jordan River and uh, a few wells, if you will. And the Jordan River comes from the north uh, where the Sea of Galilee. And because of the political situation out there, whether it's Syria to the north or uh, Israel to the west or Saudi Arabia to the south, Jordan is confined and with very, very limited resources. I think I read somewhere where it said that there is 45, I, I think, I'm just trying to remember the, statistic, the statistics correctly. We, in Jordan, they have 45 less percent, uh, or 45 less number of gallons of water that is available for us in the United States, if that gives you an indication. Uh, the, the rain in Jordan, uh, Jordan averages about maybe 300 millimeters, uh, millimeters or about 10 inches of rain per year. That tells you there's not much of it compared to what we average in Muskegon alone. We average about 33, 34 inches per year. Uh, so Jordan ha and the Jordanian government had, res had to resort to different, uh, if you will, approaches to provide the, the, the needed water. A couple of the projects that they were doing is what they call uh, what they call uh, red uh, or red to dead, which is the Red Sea connecting the Red Sea to the Dead Sea. As you've seen in that video clip right there, the Dead Sea being the the lowest uh, er, uh, the lowest point on Earth uh, allows that going from the south to the north, if you will. The, it goes against our grain of thought, if you will. You know, everything flows from north to south, except in that case, because the Dead Sea uh, is, is the lowest point on Earth, so it, 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 it can open the channel from uh, the Red Sea to the, uh, to the Dead Sea. And what that would allow is the seawater to flow to the Dead Sea and allow for the desalination process that they're talking about right now. Israel has taken on uh, a big project out there and they have done an excellent job in, in providing their citizen with the desalination, uh, with purifying basically the seawater and extracting that salt out of it and allowing it to be uh, usable for uh, con uh, human consumption. A couple of facts about Jordan. Uh, Jordan is about, the. F I, I think I read somewhere where it's the ninth largest growth country in the world. It's it, it, due to not only, uh, if you will, uh, birth, but also because of immigration. You know, the, that region is not stable. And I think we've all seen the news, you know, whether it's the Gulf War or uh, the Palestinian-Israeli issues uh, or the Syrian issue right now and the Lebanese issue. So what makes Jordan so attractive is the stability of that country. That country is very stable, so it allows for a lot of uh, immigration, if you will. Uh, comparing from the 1946, if you will, to now, the population used to be less than a million. Now you have almost six million people in Jordan. And Coupling that with the fact that Jordan is probably the fourth poorest country in the world as far as water and rainfall, that makes for a very complicated issue that the government is forced basically to deal with how do we provide water. Uh, and thus, that's where the, the red to dead, if you will, canal uh, idea came about, that they can provide, I think, about 30 to 40% of the water's need for the people of Jordan. The other big project that is, under, that is undergoing right now, or ongoing right now, and expected to be completed in 2015, if I remember correctly, is what they call the DC uh, uh, transmission main, if you will, which is extracting water from the aquifer about 340 kilometers or 200 some miles 
south of the capital, trying to bump it all the way to, um, to the capital, Amman, and that is costing the, the country about $600 million. So you can imagine, not only Jordan does it not have water, but it also does not have much natural resources to fund projects like that. So it depends on financial aid from various countries, including the United States and, and, uh, and the Gulf states and, uh, and stuff like that. Um, the, 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 the red, to, the dead, oh, excuse me, the red to dead canal, they put the estimates of uh, construction at $15 billion. And that project would take about 10 years for it to be constructed. But if it does get constructed, that will provide a, a lot of needed water. Uh, and with that, I'd like to show you that video clip about the desalination process, which is uh, cutting edge technology right now. Since the whole world, not only Jordan, the whole world needs more fresh water. I think I was listening to the news this morning coming to work. Uh, Mexico, I believe, especially the southern parts of Mexico, they're suffering through the the, the, the worst drought they have had in decades. Uh, I think they, they had an interview with a farmer that said that he had uh, planted the seeds for the last two, the crops for the last two years and has not had uh, anything to show for. Uh, and that is a scary thought, considering the fact that 75 or, or I think 75 percent of the earth is covered by water. Unfortunately, only 3% of that is, is really good for, uh, good for drinking or um, I guess the fresh water. Uh, so desalination is becoming more and more the play or, or, or the, the, the project or the concept that everybody needs to focus on. Uh, I was reading also a stat that said six countries in the world control about 50% of the entire uh, freshwater res uh, reservoirs. And those are, uh, I think I read Indonesia, Brazil, Russia, China, um, I wrote it down, Colombia. Uh, so you can imagine, we don't really have that much water in, in any other places. So everybody's going back to extracting water from the sea, that's the most obvious uh, place to get it from. And with that, I'll show you that video, how, what that process. This is about a four minute video and we'll go from there, if that's okay. Now, fortunately, advances in technology are allowing desalination to become a reliable and cost-effective water scarcity solution, transforming both brackish and seawater into fresh water. Significant breakthroughs in this technology are being led by GE with its global manufacturing capabilities and one of the largest installed bases in the world. From operating equipment and services to project financing, GE is a global leader in delivering fresh water wherever it is needed. In Algeria, GE is building a large-scale seawater desalination facility that will provide fresh water to 20% of the population of Algiers. In Spain, Water from a brackish river will be conditioned with GE's electrodialysis reversal technology to supply 20% of the drinking water for the greater Barcelona area. And in Aruba, the first large-scale use of reverse osmosis technology is being utilized to assist Web Aruba in lessening its dependence on expensive conventional thermal-based technology. Across the globe, GE delivers water for food and water for life. This alienation works. Around the world, seawater is characterized as having high levels of salt dissolved in it, approximately 70 times the recommended level for drinking water. In this illustration, seawater is withdrawn and then sent to the desalination facility where it is pre-treated to remove any suspended material. The filtration media contains pores salt water while trapping the suspended solids. The pretreated water is then pressurized by pumps up to approximately 1,000 pounds per square inch and sent to the reverse osmosis device. The water is then distributed reverse osmosis modules. Inside these vessels are the membrane elements. They're actually flat sheets that are rolled together to form a cylinder-like object. Inside these elements, pressurized water flows across the membrane Pure water passes through the membrane while the salts do not.
The result is desalinated water. The desalinated water and the salt water concentrate are now separate streams. They flow to the end of the membrane element and are collected into separate manifolds, a desalinated and a concentrate manifold. The concentrate is typically sent back to the ocean utilizing diffusion techniques while the desalinated water is stored and repressurized for distribution as drinking water or plant makeup water for industrial use. GE's leading RO desalination technology enables well, water sources to provide water for food, water for industry, and water for life. For more information, your local GE water and process technology representative to find out how easy it can be. As I had mentioned earlier, this is, this is I believe, the, the, the up and coming method and technology to providing water for, maybe not for us, but for our kids or maybe our grandkids or, or great kids or somebody in the future, but it's definitely coming and this is what the way of the future. There is not enough water, fresh water, uh, available for all of us with the population growing the way it is growing nowadays. Um, going back to what we started right here, uh, why, why I came in here is to compare my experiences. Working for the city of Muskegon, just to give you an idea, working for the city of Muskegon, we draw water from Lake Michigan via a 60-inch pipe that we have it running, running into uh, Lake Michigan, about a mile or less than a mile into Lake Michigan. Uh, and we draw the water from there, send it to the filtration plant that some of you may have driven by on uh, 1900 block of Beach Street. And we treat about 40,000, uh, excuse me, 40, we can treat up to 40 million gallons a day, which is more than enough to serve probably the entire county. At the present time, we only treat roughly around 12 to 13, maybe 14 million gallons a day. And we sell uh, water to not only the city of Muskegon residents, but we also sell it to uh, North Muskegon, Muskegon Township, Roosevelt Park, uh, and uh, Laketon Township. Uh, so in comparison, you see the availability of water that we have in here compared to what other countries, especially Jordan, uh, has to go through. What I was, I was reading before I came in here today that the Great Lakes region make up about 21% of all of the surface, the fresh surface water. So you can imagine how lucky we are to have it in here. Uh, at a cost, you know, we, we send, like I said, we have less than a mile of a 60 inch water main that draws the water into the treatment plant. For the city of Muskegon to provide the water to this many residents, which we, I, I probably estimate about 70, 80,000 people right now, it costs us about maybe three, three and a half million dollars a year. Compare that to what we were talking about, a desalination project or uh, you know, running the DC uh, transmission main in Jordan, 600 million dollars. And that's only to bring the water up. You still have to treat it and uh, the, the annual operating expense that comes with it. Thank you.